is consciousness the unified field? It's an ambitious topic, and I think we can make a little progress if I stop to review for a bit what I mean by consciousness and what I mean by the unified field. Um, I'm going to start by summarizing in a minute or two. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hundreds of years of scientific progress on a single slide. And while the details may look daunting, it's really much simpler than it looks. What science has discovered in exploring deeper levels of reality is that our universe is structured in layers of creation. Layers of creation. From the superficially diverse, macroscopic, classical world of day-to-day -day perceptions, to the deeper levels of the molecule and the atoms and the nucleus and subnuclear particles, worlds within worlds within worlds. So the surface level of sensory reality is typically called the classical world. Underlying the classical world is the world of the molecule and the atom, which is the realm of quantum mechanics. Then there's the atomic nucleus and the subnuclear particles. That's the world of quantum field theory, relativistic quantum mechanics. And finally, the emergence of unified field theories, particularly based on the superstring. These theories locate a single universal field, a unified field of nature's intelligence at the basis of the surface diversity of the universe, fulfilling, in a sense, Einstein's lifelong dream to discover the unified source of the diversified universe. So while the world is superficially complex and enormously diverse, the deeper you go into the structure of reality, the simpler nature becomes, leading ultimately to the emergence, to the discovery of fundamental unity at the basis of the surface complexity of the world. This is more than a philosophical discovery. This is really a rigorous mathematical formulation with predictive power, not enough. Um, predictive power in principle, and we can calculate and predict certain things about the universe, but unfortunately, although conceptually simple as we have seen, computationally superstring theory is perversely complex. But that's not going to stand in our way today. OK, what about this unified field? It's worth spending a minute to know about it. It is, as we'll see, not separate from ourselves. I'd like to argue that it is indistinguishable, that it is indeed our innermost self. So we have this fundamental field. We can call it, if you wish, an ocean of existence. Or I would like to say, and I'll explain what I mean by it, an ocean of intelligence at the basis of the emergence of the diversity of the universe. It's like an ocean of being, but it's a dynamic ocean. It's a dynamic field of intelligence. Quantum mechanics guarantees it's intensely dynamic. Because quantum mechanics says, the uncertainty principle, the deeper you go, the more dynamic nature becomes. That's why nuclear power is more powerful than chemical energy. The deeper you go, the more dynamic nature becomes. And we're talking about the infinitesimal scale, or Planck scale, the ultimate time and distance scale at the foundation of the universe, and hence virtually infinitely dynamic. So this universal field basically is shimmering within itself reverberating within itself and percolating, as this very elegant chart shows, <laughs> percolating what appear to be little bubbles like ginger ale effervesces bubbles. But in this case, these bubbles are strings, so-called superstrings. It is the tendency of this field to percolate superstrings. And we are living in a world of superstrings. I'm a tangle of them. You're a tangle of them. These superstrings are actually miniature rubber bands, extremely small, so that from a distance they look like and behave like particles. But they're more than particles. In addition to moving as a particle can move, these wiggle. Rubber bands wiggle. You can do that experiment at home. <laughs> and rubber bands wiggle in different ways, a very specific set of vibrational modes. They vibrate to the left, vibrate to the right, vibrate like this, vibrate like that. And nerds like me calculate the number of ways a rubber band can vibrate, particularly in a 10-dimensional space-time in which these superstrings live, and they have a lot of wiggle room in which to wiggle. 
The point is, however, we're, I say we're living in a world of super strings. What does that have to do with reality? What does that have to do with electrons and quarks and gravitons and photons? Well, depending upon how a particular string is vibrating, that string mimics, mirrors, behaves as an electron. Or if it's vibrating like this, it behaves like a graviton or a photon or a quark. And there are only certain specifiable ways that a superstring can vibrate. And remarkably, as we'll see later, those vibrational tones, those vibrational modes, those specific frequencies map to the different elementary particles and forces that comprise the universe. So it's an extraordinary theory where you have one universal reality, one ocean of existence, whose various vibrational tones like a guitar string has certain vibrational tones, the fundamental and the harmonics. The different vibrational tones of the unified field are what we used to think of, we used to call the electron, and the quark, and the photon, and the graviton. So we're living in a world really not of particles. We're living in a symphony, in a sense. Different fundamentals and harmonics of this ocean of existence, ocean of intelligence that give the appearance of a material universe, but only from the most superficial perspective. Um, all right, so that's the unified field. And I've called it a field of intelligence, and I want to explain what I mean by that for now. I don't want to anthropomorphize it too much. It is the origin of the laws of nature. It is the unified source of the diverse laws of nature governing the whole universe at every level. And the laws of nature are the orderly, intelligent principles governing the universe. The laws of nature make the universe understandable and predictable, comprehensible, intelligible. They are the orderly, responsible for all order throughout the universe. They are the orderly, intelligent principles governing the universe. And if the unified field is the unified source, the compact, concentrated source of all those laws of nature and all the order displayed throughout the universe, it must, in some sense, be the most concentrated field of intelligence in nature. In addition to percolating strings, if you really look into it, explore what's called quantum gravity, quantum cosmology, in addition to percolating these miniature rubber, beam, rubber bands, and by the way, if you find the thought that the ultimate reality, the deep truth of the universe is a rubber band, if you find that idea <laughs> disturbing, the rubber band is not the reality the ocean of existence and the ocean of intelligence that gives rise to an infinity of rubber bands, that's a bigger reality. <laughs> and more than rubber bands, in fact, whole universes appear to bubble out of this ocean of existence. And this is a, it's called a, a micro black hole. These are realities, these are calculable realities. Superstring theory says they're there, but it also says most of them are duds. And they live an extremely short period of time, and they disappear in a flash of burst of energy. But some of these little bubbles, given the right initial conditions, inflate. That means they expand exponentially into universes. They spawn galaxies and you know, trillions and trillions of stars and planets, possibly populated with civilizations like ours. So this unified field is the origin of universes. And naive calculations suggest an infinity of simultaneously coexisting universes, of which we are the occupants of one. So it's a huge ocean of intelligence. It's an enormous ocean of creativity that gives rise to an infinity, an infinite diversity of universes. So that's the end of the physics lesson. This unified field is an infinitely dynamic and non-material, by the way, quantum mechanics tells us this. It takes a bit to explain it, but quantum mechanics tells us this is not a material field. It's non-material. Call it a field of intelligence, maybe field of pure abstract existence. And it's self-interacting, in a sense, self-aware. What do I mean by that? I mean that, for example, light is not self-aware. The electromagnetic field isn't aware of itself. You can take two flashlight beams and they'll pass right through each other. They won't know about each other, won't interact with each other. Light's not aware of light. But the unified field is aware 
of its own existence. In the sense, it interacts with itself, which is a good thing, as I said, because there ain't nothing else down there for it to interact <laughs> with. And that dynamical self-interaction is what leads to the sequential emergence, stage by stage, of the increasingly diversified universe. Is this, by the way, I'll pose a question, is this fundamental field of intelligence, the origin of universes, a field of pure life, a field of pure intelligence, pure consciousness, or is it a field of inertia? Is it a field of death? Um, I'll leave that answer to you for the moment. I can't go much farther until we talk a little bit about consciousness, or what I mean by consciousness. And I'm going to talk about that first in the context of meditation. Meditation, classically understood, is a technique to take the outwardly directed attention powerfully within to explore quieter, deeper levels of mind, more fundamental, more abstract, more powerful levels of human intelligence. And if you look at the Yoga Sutras, for example, the Vedic literature, they talk about this inward flow, this inward exploration of quieter levels of consciousness as corresponding to the exploration of deeper levels of intelligence in nature. You can support that. You can actually look at the mathematics that corresponds to these quieter levels of thought. And the mathematics at these different levels corresponds to the behavior of the universe at these deeper and deeper levels. Then this inward flow of the awareness can culminate in seconds or minutes, depends on the efficiency of the technique, in the experience of going beyond thought, transcending all mental activity, all cognitive processing, all visualization, all concentration, all contemplation to a state of pure being, pure abstract awareness at the foundation of mind and according to the Vedic understanding, traditional understanding, at the basis of all of matter. The direct experience, awareness which is normally sharply bound by the specific objects of attention, relaxes from that outward focus and expands and relaxes and expands and expands and then becomes, boom, infinite. Identifies with this universal field of intelligence at the basis of the universe. All right, let's talk about that state, this hypothetical state, this meditative state, state of pure consciousness or samadhi. What is it? Well, among other things, it has an absolutely striking neurophysiological signature. It corresponds to a completely different style of functioning of the brain, one of profound orderliness of brain functioning, completely different from waking, dreaming, sleeping, hypnosis, anything else, and I'll come back to that, is this expression, yoga, yoga, chitta, vritti, nirodha. Yoga, state of union, unity, Unity consciousness, unified state of consciousness, is the complete settling of the activity of the mind. Emphasis on complete. You take your foot off the gas, you close your eyes, you stop working the brain, it'll settle down to an idling state. Some degree of rest, some degree of relaxation, some degree of quiet, but not much, frankly. <laughs> With you know, techniques to draw, lure, entice the awareness deeper and deeper within to the experience of this field of bliss at the basis of thought, that's what I mean by meditation. I don't mean mere relaxation. And there's a difference, physiologically. This is an important meta-analysis of many published studies comparing samadhi, transcending, with mere rest, with mere sleep. And the level of rest during the meditative state is much, much deeper than the rest gained during the deepest portion of a night's sleep. And as the awareness is drawn deeply within, again, the style of functioning of the brain changes from high frequency gamma activity when there's a lot of work and cognitive processing and concentration to more subtle states of mind, to the most subtle state of mind, in which you have this profound state of orderliness, what's called global EEG coherence that envelops the entire brain. It's important, we'll come back to that too. In terms of the effect on health, just to mention that what's going on here is something very real, as a way of reducing stress, transcending samadhi is much more powerful than mere relaxation. 
Similarly for lowering blood pressure, it's more powerful than progressive muscle relaxation. It's simply a deeper level of mind and a deeper level of physiological rest. The powerful effects on reducing cardiovascular risk factors like, like uh, diabetes and atherosclerosis. This study I'm gonna, just going to present for a moment because it's so extraordinary. It is about to appear in the journal Archives of Eternal Medicine, which is published by the AMA, which is especially extraordinary, um, <laughs> showing that this is a 10-year longitudinal NIH-funded study on meditation and heart disease. And they took patients with heart disease, and everybody took their medicine, and everybody had their dietary and exercise regimen. But they took half the group, and they added transcending to their regimen. And the result of that 10-year study was a two-thirds reduction, a highly statistically significant reduction, in the incidence of heart attack, stroke, and death. Now, these aren't subtle measurements. You, can't, you wouldn't want to fake a death. This is really, you know, <laughs> this is extremely robust research. And in the world of alternative medicine, I don't think there's ever been a study as powerful that says that mind-body medicine is real. The effect of mind on physiology is powerful particularly, again, transcending. And this really made the news all over the world. So the effects of meditation on health are important, and that's why tens of thousands of doctors you know, recommend you do your meditation. But more interesting to what we're talking about is the effect on the brain. And here it is again. This is a top view, front view of the brain. And this is a subject sitting relaxed with the eyes closed. And these little dots indicate where the electrodes are placed to measure the or ordinary EEG to look at the electrical activity of the brain. And occasionally you'll find these little bars that connect neighboring points. Not very often. But what that means is these neighboring points of the brain are talking to each other. They're communicating. There's a correlated or integrated functioning of the brain, at least among a few neighboring points, but not much. Really, this hemisphere doesn't know what this hemisphere is doing. But this is the same subject three months later in the meditative state. And what you see is something you will never see if you're a brain scientist in any other state of consciousness, hypnosis, sleeping, waking, dreaming. The whole brain functions coherently. And that's an extremely significant finding. It's interesting, but beyond that, significant. Because EEG coherence is powerfully correlated with intelligence and rising intelligence, creativity, learning ability, memory, academic performance, moral reasoning, psychological stability, emotional maturity, alertness, reaction time. Everything good about the brain depends on its orderly functioning. And what's fun as an educator, exciting as an educator, is that you can systematically develop the orderly functioning of the brain among anyone of any age. And you'll actually start to see in anyone of any age intelligence, for example, IQ, increasing. Now, that's not supposed to happen beyond adolescence. Intelligence is not supposed to rise. In fact, by the time you're, say, mid-30s, you expect to see a precipitous drop in intelligence and a shrinking of the gray. I know we tell our kids, you should listen to me anyway, despite my loss of raw intelligence, because of the <laughs> wisdom and the life experience. But it's an obsolete view of human potential. And the thing about the brain is, and these are other measures of intelligence. IQ is just one, but there's so many ways to measure the creativity and intelligence of the brain. And they're all highly statistically significantly improved by transcending, by developing and engaging the total brain. In the absence of this experience, you see too much of this. This is a stressed brain. You don't have to look hard or far to find them. You see what are called functional holes, not actual holes, but functional holes in the prefrontal cortex, the so-called higher brain. That's important. This is the higher brain. It separates us from the primitive species. It's, it's called the CEO or executive center. It sits over the primitive brain. It exerts executive control. It's responsible for higher human functions, judgment, planning, moral reasoning, control of the attention. And what we have in the presence of stress is the prefrontal cortex shuts down. And under chronic stress, it shuts down chronically, and it fails to develop properly. 
and we really are living to a good degree in a underdeveloped world, a world of arrested development. And if you really, you know, question that, just look around you. Look at a reality TV show. Look what's happening, you know, in the news. But even those functional holes in the brain are quickly filled in as the entire brain is engaged and as blood flow returns to the total brain. And you see things like in maximum security prisons where the stress brains are ubiquitous, a marked reduction in the rate of return to prison. In children with ADHD, which is a stress-related learning disorder, has to do with this underdevelopment of the prefrontal cortex that controls the attention, a profound reversal of ADHD, elimination of symptoms, in 10, 12 weeks of twice daily meditation. It's a powerful tool. Because of that, finally, we're starting to see an impact on society. Where schools, about 350 of them anyway, and hundreds of thousands of students, have incorporated transcending, or TM, into the curriculum. And that's the beginning of something really exciting. And it's really happening here. It started in the Bay Area, and it's spreading throughout the world. Back to my theme. Um, pure consciousness. What do I mean by consciousness? I don't mean thought. I'm not talking about the content of awareness, sensory content, cognitive content, emotional content. I'm talking about awareness itself, the fundamental quality of subjectivity, of the liveliness of subjectivity at the basis of the mind, consciousness, the self, that which sees that which knows, even though it which itself is unseen, typically unknown. That's what I mean by consciousness. Is this state of unbounded awareness, the state of inner, ex maximally expanded consciousness, the state of inner immortality, inner bliss, is this state of unbounded awareness at the basis of our subjective world, the same field, unified field, at the basis of the rest of the universe? That's the question I'd like to pose. Well, you can look at the qualities of pure consciousness. We've talked about a few of them, intelligence, dynamism, self-awareness, self-interaction. And you can actually do a systematic job with that and really thoughtfully explore what the qualities of the unified field are and the qualities of consciousness. And I'm not going to go there. Because although it's rather striking, for a quantitative scientist, it is inevitably tied to semantics, and you know, it's not ultimately satisfying. I do something much harder, and that's look at the quantitative or structural correspondence between our own self, unbounded awareness, pure consciousness, and the unified field of physics. All right, we'll have to do this quickly. The unified field gives rise to the emergent universe. The vibrational modes or tones or resonances of the unified field are the elementary particles that fill the universe. Let's take a careful, more careful look at what those particles are. What is the structure of the universe that emerges from the unified field? Well, it emerges in stages. In the first stage in the, of the emergence of the universe within the field of space-time, this is really beyond field of conventional space-time. This is beyond the Planck scale. In the world of space-time, the universe sprouts as three fundamental entities called superfields, the gravity, gauge, and matter superfields. Still a very unified, simple world. Then the breaking of supersymmetry, which links bosons and fermions. And these three become five. These are the fundamental spin types. Gravity, gravitino, spin one forces like light spin one half particles like quarks and leptons in our friends, the Higgs boson. And from there, it gets more and more and more and more diverse. So we know the structure of the emergent universe. We know the structure of the resonances, the reverberant frequencies of the superstring. You can count them. You can calculate them. And they agree with the emergent universe. It's one of the amazing things about the superstring. You can do the same thing with consciousness. You can take consciousness in its simplest settled state, maximally expanded state, pure consciousness, samadhi. And you can learn to stimulate that ocean of deep silence, essentially strum it like a guitar, and excite systematically its fundamental reverberant frequencies. 
There's a whole technology for this described in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. And when you see the reverberant modes of what emerges from consciousness, these are really the building blocks of thought, the building blocks of, of speech, and the building blocks even of the human physiology. When you see what comes out of consciousness, what are its reverberant frequencies, and what comes out of it, you find the very same structure. What structure? You see this very same structure of emergence. We call it gravity gauge and matter superfields, but in the language of consciousness, that's called vata, pitta, kapha prakriti. And more expressed level of that threefold reality is the five so-called mahabhutas, akasha, vayu, tejas, apas, priti. That's space, air, fire, water, and earth. Well, that's an interesting numerical coincidence. Let's take a little bit of a deeper look. Well, it's more than a little coincidence. It's an astonishing structural correspondence between the emergence of consciousness and the emergence of physics. These five, as we saw, are paired in precisely these pairings called vata, pitta, kapha, prakriti, those and none other. In physics, these five spin types, which are all the particles and forces in the universe, admit only these pairings. Those are the only ones that are mathematically sensible. And so it's really quite an interesting structural correspondence, but it's more than structure. What are these things? What is akasha? Well, it's sometimes translated as ether. It's space as subtle substance. Space as subtle substance. But what is the spin two graviton field? Spin two graviton field is the field of curved space-time geometry. Space as relativistic fluid. Space as subtle substance. And you go through these things, you say, my God, the approach is different. One is objective intellectual, the other is experiential, but they're talking about the same unified field with the same structure of emergence. And I'll have to cut this, this argument short, but the miracle really just starts there. Because in addition to what comes out of the unified field, in addition to these so-called physical elements that come out of consciousness, like akasha, what about the world of consciousness itself? What about the world of the superstring itself? That has its own structure, precise mathematical structure. And I've tried to capture that structure concisely here. It is structure of the superstring is a sequential emergence of numbers. Uh, these are the so-called vibrational degrees of freedom of the heterotic string. And they emerge in a sequence of 8 to 24 to 64 to 192, and then the universe. From there, space-time starts. Um, when you look at the structure of pure consciousness and all of its fundamental internal reverberations, those are innumerable, and they are individually experienceable as the fluctuations of consciousness. And that can be experienced, but it's already been mapped out in the Vedic literature. It's, um, that's also the structure of eight, called eight, the apara of eight, or a richa of 24, or a sukta of 192. It's the same emergent structure. So we have not only emerging from the unified field, but within the unified field, a commonality, a quantitative correspondence that seems quite profound. I was going to actually count these 192 modes of the string for you, but I won't. But what's amazing about the structure of consciousness mirroring the structure of the unified field, suggesting that they are one and the same. And the 192 fundamental reverberant frequencies of the unified field is that you see that same structure within the human DNA, and you see it again within the human nervous system. In the 192, what are called ascending and descending reticular formations, or nerve endings, or gateways to consciousness. These are the gateways to consciousness. And there are 192 of those, and it's like the whole DNA and the whole brain was made to reverberate in the structure of wholeness, which is the fundamental reality of the unified field. It explains, I think, why we can experience the unified field. We can resonate with that unity. And I don't think, for example, a newt could. <laughs> and that's probably because a newt doesn't have 192 ascending and descending reticular formations. Subject of another talk. So anyway, we have a few arguments. 
that the unified field and the field of pure consciousness are the same. We've talked about, I won't mention the qualitative core, but we've talked about a detailed quantitative correspondence. Another thing, very important, probably the last argument I'll have time for, are what are called field effects of consciousness. And you're going to hear on Sunday afternoon De Dean Radin present more data that really unequivocally shows the existence of field effects, long-range effects of consciousness. I have been involved in a series of experiments that take large groups of meditating experts who are proficient at transcending. It's not particularly hard to do. The hard part is gathering together. It's like herding cats. <laughs> and I conducted one experiment in Washington, D.C., and we predicted in advance, based on 51 previous experiments, that we would see within a couple of weeks a marked reduction in crime. Crime is an expression of acute stress. And when the calming effect of meditation has a spillover effect, undoubtedly, and that's been measured time and again. And this is a highly significant effect. But if we go back in time, I do want to show this. These amazing studies on war and the ability to turn off war and war-torn areas, like the Middle East, like a light switch on the basis of a thousand or fewer people meditating as a group, highly statistically significant. And when that was first published in Yale Journal, Conflict Resolution, they said, you know, we have to publish this. This is absolutely high quality research. But for God's sakes, do it again. Get other groups. Repeat this experiment because it's so unbelievable, frankly, and it's so important potentially. And these experiments have been done again and again and again. And in every case where you have a group big enough to produce a predictable effect, you have very, very powerful results. Well, how do you explain that? I mean, how can a group of, say, 7,000, 8,000 people in Iowa have an effect on the entire country, a calming effect? on It's more than, there's something deeper going on. We're involved in creating bigger and bigger groups. And that's what we call field effects of consciousness expressions of the fact that consciousness is, although in some respects localized here, in its deeper respects, it is unlocalized, universal, unbounded. From the ultimate perspective, there's only one consciousness in this room. You know, it's, it's each and every one of you. But at our foundation, at our core, that is one. There are deep explanations of how this, we affect one another at a distance. And some of those explanations have been discussed before, like the effects of quantum mechanics can be non-local, and you can exploit that in principle. We do it in the laboratory. It doesn't even violate relativistic causality. But even deeper, even deeper explanations that really involve the unified field, I think, are the most compelling. I'm going to mention one because it has other interesting effects. You may not know this because many physicists don't, but in addition to the matter in this room, all the particles and forces we know and love, there are others that we do not know. This is called the hidden sector world or the hidden world. In addition to, so we have in addition to observable sector particles and forces like gravity and quarks, we have in the same room flying around a whole other set of particles predicted by the superstring. We don't hear a lot about them because they're considered to be irrelevant. They only interact with us through gravity, and gravity is extremely weak, negligible, ignorable. But that calculation is in ultimately not correct. And when it's done more carefully, you can actually show that this hidden sector world of matter interacts with us, although weakly. It interacts with us, but weakly. And the qualities of that hidden sector matter, although we don't know everything about it, is, of course, it interacts weakly with us. It's visible, but dimly so. It may take special training to peer into this hidden sector world. Maybe there's a convention going on right now in the hidden sector world. I doubt it, but it's possible. <laughs> hidden sector world is very cold. It's about one degree on the absolute scale of temperature, which is kind of cool because, literally, because it means it's basically a superfluid world. It's a world of macroscopic quantum coherent effects. 
An interesting thing about this, a little technical for tonight, is it's got what's called macroscopic confinement. And that's a very good thing. Because as an ex explanation for, for what I, some of you may refer to as subtle bodies, and I'm going to suggest that these actually exist. The problem with subtle bodies, astral bodies, is what the heck are they made of? And why can't I see them? Well, you might say, well, they're, they're made of light. They're a luminous body. No, they're not made of light. What are they made of? Hidden sector matter. If they exist at all, they must be made of hidden sector matter. And this hidden sector matter is really cool because it creates bodies of a certain macroscopic size. And those bodies cling to us electrostatically. They can also be separated from us. And they actually provide, have very interesting properties which make it actually a thinking body, possibly a useful tool, a helper to the brain. And what do I mean by that? This is my final remark. You may wonder how this physical brain, this slab of meat, <laughs> can experience the incredible subtlety and the microscopic reality of the unified field. Well, actually, I don't think it's uh, too far-fetched to understand how it can. But that is a subject of another talk, a talk I'd like to have with anyone who's interested at this conference. But in addition to that, it may not have to do so all by itself. It may have a helper, because the properties of this hidden sector body, which includes something called scale invariance, are such that the hidden body, hidden sector body, or subtle body, if you wish, is as comfortable thinking at this level as at this level. Size doesn't matter. That's what scale invariance means. So, the hidden sector body can provide a conduit, if you wish, for our macroscopic thoughts and our macroscopic brain and our macroscopic appreciation and perceptions can tie to, link to, this level of life which is much, much, much smaller and much, much deeper. All right, I'm going to conclude by saying there are reasons to believe that subtle bodies exist, physical reasons. And if they do exist and participate in the process of thought, they can be a, an adjunct, an assistant to the brain in interfacing with the unified field. And that brings me to my conclusion. I've left about two-thirds of this out. Is pure consciousness not this very localized, very relative, very specific human experience, but at the core of human experience, the field of pure life, pure consciousness, the self, we call it the self because it is the deepest core aspect of our own reality, our own inner nature, timeless, unchanging. Is that the unified field? Is the unified field consciousness? There are a number of arguments to support it. One I did not stress is the obvious qualitative correspondence between these two unified fields. Second, quantitative correspondence. I could only touch on it, but there really is a remarkable structural, precise mathematical correspondence between what we call the self, pure consciousness, and the unified field now brought to light by, the, by modern physics, particularly the superstring. Extraordinary. Third, experimentally observed, undeniable, long-range field effects of consciousness. These long-range effects of consciousness are not easily explained by the cell phone or by shouting. We're talking about distances that are simply too far. But they are most naturally explained by quantum mechanical mechanisms and even more perhaps naturally explained unified field theoretic mechanisms. Finally, I will say, as an additional argument that we haven't gone into, are classical SIDHIs, supernormal abilities that have been discussed in every age, every culture, every spiritual tradition. If, for example, anyone, anywhere, at any time, for example, has, has ever levitated, for example, or if anything, for example, that, that Jesus Christ did in the scriptures, if any of that was real, I mean, some will say, well, he was a, a trickster and he was, had died, he put it into the water and it looked like wine. I, I don't buy it. Um, if anyone, at any time, had any of these supernormal abilities, that automatically puts consciousness on a deeper level. It un um, unambiguously pl places consciousness on the level of the unified field. But since I'm not in a position tonight, unless there's a volunteer, 
to demonstrate these supernormal abilities, I will not use that as an argument either. But in addition to all of these are the philosophical problems and neuroscientific problems in explaining consciousness as something more superficial, as explaining consciousness as derivative of matter. It just doesn't work. That also forces a deeper understanding of consciousness. The simplest, most parsimonious explanation is that, is that these two unified fields, one at the basis of human experience, one at the basis of everything else in nature, that these two unified fields are one. Thank you very much. Thank you.